So it's probably worth reminding ourselves about the different wavelengths of light. We've talked about That's them a right. bit and we've covered them in great depth in other parts of this course, in the STARS course, but let's go over it again just as a reminder. It is, because it's quite relevant for when we're talking about space, because as we'll talk about a little bit later, there's dramatic benefits of going to space because we can see different colors of light than we can here on Earth. So light, as we've talked about earlier, is a wave. And the wave length changes depending on the type of color. So as you go to what we call the shorter wavelengths, the wavelengths get shorter. It also means that there's more energy in these wavelengths. OK, so in the middle is visible light with a wavelength of about half a micrometer. That's right. Um, then you get infrared with a wavelength of a few micrometers. They're still too small to see with the human eye, but the very top of the infrared you're talking about, microwaves, a wavelength of about a centimeter. That's right. Uh, radio waves, a wavelength of meters. So you this big, or some of them are this big, some are you know, hundreds of meters or even kilometers long. That's right. Down the other end, it's all ridiculously small. I mean, <laughs> x-rays have a uh, um, tenth of a nanometer or something. Exactly. That's why you can use x-rays to uh, look at atomic structure, because it's actually small enough to resolve atoms. You couldn't do it with visible light. Exactly. And, so, and this is quite relevant for space. So depending on what type of light we want to look at, either up or down, will dictate either what sort of wavelengths we can look at, and as we explored earlier in that equation, the longer the wavelengths, the blurrier the image. The blurrier the image. So as we go this way, our image blurs. As we go this way, our image sharpens. But there's some other issues. Well, there's a trade-off. I mean, that's right. Our telescope has to be of a precise shape to about a tenth of whatever wavelength you're working at. Exactly. So if you're working in the visible, where the wavelength is about half a micron, that means your mirror has to be polished to maybe about one fiftieth of a micrometer. That's right. Which is Takes a lot of work. Anyway, that's right. It's doable, you, though, but it's doable. it's doable. But that would not be good enough in that's the right. X-ray. Yeah. X-ray and gamma ray mirrors have to be much better polished than that. Yep. On the other hand, in the radio, if you're working at a wavelength of like five meters, nope. then chicken wire is a perfectly good mirror. Exactly. And in fact, many radio telescopes are made of chicken wire, and that's perfectly fine. That's right. And so this will dictate again kind of what sort of telescope you have to build yep. and what the size is. So radio telescopes can be very big because you can make them out of chicken wire. Um, and they need to be because the wavelength is so long if they That's weren't right. very big, you would not be able to see any detail. Exactly. And because this all relates to our energy, it's essentially related to the frequency and the wavelength. Again, that wavelength number which we explored earlier. This yep, so the equation here, this is uh, a constant. Planck's, Planck's constant. constant. Don't need to worry about what it is, except right. it's a very small number. So it's times the frequency, um, or more relevant, Planck's constant. This is C, which is the speed C of light, point. divided by the wavelength. Exactly. So if you want to work out how much energy one particle of light has, um, look up Planck's constant on Google, multiply by the speed of light, and divide by the wavelength in meters. Exactly. That will give you the energy in joules. That's right. And this will dictate, essentially, what our telescope is being powered by or seeing, and then how sensitive it needs to be in terms of physical operation. Because there's no point if your telescope can't pick up these little particles of light. If you're looking at gamma rays and you're not tuned to pick up those energies, you're not going to see anything. Now. The other big consideration when it comes through is the type of light and how it affects and interacts with our atmosphere, right, Paul? That's right, and this uh, is kind of a double whammy for space That's observations. Right. So let's imagine you're in space and you want to look at the Earth's surface. You are limited to the wavelengths where your light can get through the atmosphere. Exactly. Unless you're studying the atmosphere. That's right. So, for example, spacecraft that will measure water vapor might go at one of these wavelengths here because this is actually blocked by water vapor in the atmosphere. And so, by seeing how much it's blocked, whether you can see down to 10 kilometers or 5 kilometers, you can work out how humid it is, which is very useful if you're trying to do weather forecasts. That's right. And, you know, and likewise, when you want to look at the ultraviolet, the ultraviolet is blocked by our ozone layer. So, when so, we look up from the ground, we don't see it. But from space, you can look down and see how much ozone there is and whether it's been destroyed or not. That's right, exactly. Maybe you don't want to see that, but that's right. Yep. But if you actually want to see the Earth's surface, then you'd want to pick, say, visible light, a few particular windows in the infrared, like the one at 10 micron for thermal imaging, or out in the radio. That's right. Um, on the other hand, if you're an astronomer and you want to look out, this is a huge benefit to being to exactly. space. Exactly. Because if we want to study the x-rays coming from some very hot thing in space, we can't do it from the Earth's surface. There, there's just do no, not get through, damn There's it. just no way, no matter what, no matter how hard you try, Paul. Yeah. So, and we'd like to observe all the different wavelengths because they all tell us different things about objects in space. That's right. And most of the wavelengths, we have to be in space to do it. It doesn't matter how good your telescope is on Earth, you're looking in the dark, it's nothing that, to see. Exactly, and so this is kind of that, as you said, that double whammy of space. Depending on whether you want to look down or up, 
will really change on what are the reasons why and what are you doing. You know, some people always say, hey, can't you just flip the Hubble Space Telescope or look down to it? Now, there's other practical considerations, but if the Hubble looks in the ultraviolet and looks down towards the Earth, it's just going to see the ozone. It's not going to be able to see below that. There's just no physical way. And also, in that case, there's a brightness limit. That's right. I mean, for most of the things we're looking at at space, they're so faint that you get like a photon an hour. So the telescope is designed to look really intently for one particular place for hours on end. If you try to look down, it would be blinded by the amount of light bouncing off. And also, it would be moving so fast over the surface, everything would be blurred. Exactly. An Earth observation satellite has to be able to track. Sometimes they just measure a slot and then they f move over, that's right. constantly scanning there, or sometimes they'll track as something moves over. We don't need to worry about studying no. a supernova that's a billion light years away. Exactly. So the, the type of light, the way light works, and the way our atmosphere works presents challenges, but also presents the benefits and desires to go and observe from space.